Today we're going to look at another scripture that many have used to support their prosperity teaching of Christianity. Don't get me wrong, Christianity is the only faith, in my opinion, that gives you real prosperity because it comes with eternal life. The things here are fleeting and they will pass. But there is a scripture that is often pointed to that says, wow, this is a, a prosperous teaching and God has riches in store for us. I'm going to look, this is uh, from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but that he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. So the question is, don't these scriptures point to prosperity? And i like to just show you that when we take them in context, they really don't. These verses here were said on the heels of the encounter with the rich young ruler. As a matter of fact, it is the, it is the same. Right after the rich young ruler had left, this was Jesus' interaction with his disciples. And so we're going to back up here just a little, a little bit. You know, does it make sense that God, you know, through Jesus is promising material wealth? And so we need to look back at what's going on here. Okay, the rich young ruler realizes that something is wrong and something is lacking in his life where he's not going to receive eternal life. And Jesus tells him what is missing. In verse 21 of chapter 10, he says, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And of course, he went away. And then Jesus looked around on, and says to his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? His disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go in through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So you see here that Jesus said three times how difficult it is for the rich to enter in the kingdom of God. This encounter with the rich young ruler is in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I will have uh, the references to those in the description at the bottom. But you can see what Jesus had said to the rich young ruler about what, what he lacked and what he needed to do. He said, sell what you have, give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Indeed, this is, this is pretty much exactly what Jesus had, had called his disciples with also. There is nothing different in this. And he says three consecutive times how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so what happens as it, as it progresses on, Peter realizes that, hey, we've left everything for Jesus already. He said, and so he thinks about it. Okay, he, they have already done that. And so it's actually in verse 28, when Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And in some of these, in at least one of these other encounters, it says, what Peter is further saying, what shall we have? And then Jesus answered about having family and lands and, and such the like. And so this is the follow-up. This is just one continuous event. And so what is Jesus really saying? When he said, when he tells them that they will have, if you have left your house and your family, your lands, you know, for Jesus sake and for the gospels, you will have a lot more, but with persecutions and in the life to come, you know, eternal life. Now we have to remember also that Jesus teaching here with the rich young ruler and what he had said, this was kind of late in his earthly ministry. Okay. The, uh, not including of course the passion. There are several chapters in each of these Gospels which deal with the Passion, but, but for his regular teaching, in Matthew it's chapter 19, of course Mark is chapter 10, and it's uh, chapter 18 in Luke. And there were only a few chapters after that in each book that, that were the regular teachings of Jesus before uh, the account of his suffering for our sins on the cross. 
And so when we think of it like this, we're saying, did what Jesus say here in, in two little verses just negate all the things he said, including the things he had just said to the rich young ruler? He said he would have treasure in heaven. He said he had to take up the cross. He said how hard it was for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why is Jesus going to turn around and say he will give to his disciples those things that will make them stumble and fall? And when you take it in context, I mean, just take this looking briefly through the book of Luke again, as I like to do, Luke 1, 53, he has filled the hungry, that is God, has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. We go to chapter 6, verse 20. Blessed, are, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. We look at 6.24. Woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. If you're getting rich here in this world, you're not going to have it to life eternal. And there's an example of that shortly to come. In Luke 9.23, Jesus said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me. We see another account again given in Luke chapter 12. Do you remember the man who had, who had much goods laid up for himself and he was building new barns? But God said, this night your soul is required of thee. What good will those things do to you now after you have died? Let me look at Luke 16. As we look at 16, it says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. That is, money or material riches. You can't serve God and mammon. This last day's church has said, If you serve God, you will get mammon. And that is not at all the case. God has promised to provide for our needs. He has not promised to make us wealthy in a material sense for enjoyment in this world. He has said, if we love our lives here in this world, we will lose them. Please take the message of the entire Bible. But it continues here. The Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things and they derided him. And Jesus said to them, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. So you just have to think again, if you're pursuing after riches, that's exactly what the unsaved world does. Where are your values? Where is your affection? Are you looking toward eternity and the things of eternity? Or are you just looking toward the things of this life? Let me continue again. I've said Jesus promised to meet your needs. So when we see that Jesus is saying, you know, he will, he will provide many more lands, family, children, things such of this nature. Let me just go back to this real quickly. Oh. And so you'll understand, what was Jesus promising when he said this? Was Jesus actually promising that they would be wealthy? No, I don't think so. When you look at this, say you will take the example from Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 to 50. Do you remember Jesus' family, his mother and his brethren, were kind of outside the crowd. They wanted to see him. And they let Jesus know, hey, they want to see you. And he said, who is my family? Who are my mother and my brethren? They that, do, that know the will of God and keep it. Those that do the will of God. Guess what? That includes an awful lot of people. So in other words, when Jesus is telling his disciples that they're going to have a lot of family, that means fellow believers, that means the body of Christ. We can see that forthcoming. We see it also when it's mentioned in, in uh, Luke twenty-two thirty-five 35, near the end of his life. Jesus asked his disciples, in all this time you have been with me, what have you lacked? And they said, we have lacked nothing, Lord. He provided everything that they needed. They didn't need to be wealthy or depend on things. And maybe this is why Jesus is saying this about giving, you know, about them having houses and lands and, and families and stuff like this. Because that is typically what you would think of in a normal life. You're kind of building up a provision that will, that will 
hold you. You know, you can make money off it to provide for your food and your daily living. And Jesus is just saying, I'll take care of you. You'll have plenty. Don't worry about it. You know why? Because God said the silver is mine and the gold is mine. But we see again, this is very powerful in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. You'll see where the disciples were all together. They were in one accord. And people were selling everything they had. They were laying it at the apostles' feet. And they would divide it to people as they had need. So you can see this was one giant family. They had a lot of land. They had a lot of houses. Okay. Those material things weren't really of value. It was really just what we need to live in this world. And God is saying he will provide it. If you look further in the book of Acts, say you're looking at the travels of Paul. You'll remember at one time Lydia brought Paul and his entourage into her house. She offered uh, to take care of them, to let them stay there. Or Aquila and Priscilla. Paul stayed with them because they were of the same trade. They were tent makers and they were taking care of him. So you see, this is more likely what Jesus is meaning. He's not turning around and saying, give up everything so I will make you rich and destroy your faith. <laughs> He's not saying that. It doesn't make any sense. But there are some that are trying to pull out two verses of the Bible and ignore the context that it's given in, both with the direct passage and also in the rest of Scripture. So we can see this well from Philippians 4, 11 and 12, that in whatever state we are in, we are to be content with that. Whether we have a lot or whether we have a little, we know how to be hungry. We know how to be full. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And later in 419, God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we can see there are teachings of scripture that contradict these two verses in Mark. You will find verses like that in Matthew and Luke, but you're also going to find the entire context of the meeting with the rich young ruler and what happens afterward. And I also just like to ask you, you know, what, what do you think when you start to read 1 Timothy chapter 6? Of course, if you follow me at all, you know I, I beat on this quite a bit, but the thing is, we cannot take some of Scripture and ignore other key parts of Scripture. We have to see what God is saying to us, what he's really saying to us. And it is consistent. It does make sense. But if we are being a little too covetous, we ought to watch out. Starting at verse 6 in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, that is clothing, let us be there with content. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Just remember that Jesus said very plainly, you cannot serve God and mammon. God is not promising to make you rich in this life, but he will promise whatever you need. And if you find yourself in possession of something, an unexpected blessing of material you don't know, consider that God has put that there for a reason. And wait to see, pray to see, what he wants you to do with it. Because that is probably what it is there for. It is not there to squander your riches on a good life in this world. Our lives are, are bound up in Christ. But I also wanted to remind you of something else that's very important. You know, people are so quick to give the Lord credit for the riches in their lives. But the scripture says that Satan is the God of this world. Now remember when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, that the devil took him up into a high mountain and showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, said to Jesus, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for it is delivered to me. And to whomsoever I will give it, 
If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So be very careful with the riches that you receive. And if there is serious temptation to do something wrong or to squander it on material well-being, you know, that is not need. God will supply your need. Hey, if you need a car for your ministry, if you need a car that is, uh, you know, for your family going back and forth, I mean, God will provide you a car. He will do that. He may not provide you the top of the line luxury vehicle. He will provide, he will provide for your needs. But I'm just saying, be careful because Satan knows how to bless also or how to tempt. Just make sure your heart is right with the Lord. And remember again, let's take all of scripture in the context in which it is given and not be so quick to pull out a couple verses here or there and let them be twisted into something that's very appealing to the flesh. May God bless.